Today, you've decided to visit an oil refinery. You walk up to the entrance, and unless you're on a special list of people, that's where your adventure ends. Let's say you are one of those special people, and the guard at the entrance lets you in. Now what? Can you just walk around the facility wherever you want to go? Of course not. Each person only has access to the areas that they need to have access to. But who decides where each person can go and where they can't? How do they decide which doors have access restrictions and which ones you can just walk through? It may not surprise you that these same decisions are also made in the digital world of communication. In this video, we're going to learn about these two worlds of security policy, the physical world and the digital world. We'll discover how they work the same way and how they're different. Let's go. When I was growing up, very few people in our community locked their doors. The assumption was that only people who needed to would walk through our door, and if they did, we expected them to respect the people and property inside. Everyone assessed the risk of keeping doors unlocked as pretty low. That's definitely not the case anymore. Today, people put locks on everything, including the front door, their bedroom door, their office door, and on the safe that keeps their most valued possessions protected. A couple of things are happening here. First, at a base level, the risk associated with letting someone through a door got high enough for us to put controls or locks on each of these doors. Then we decided who could be trusted to go through each of these doors. A person coming through my front door doesn't automatically have access to the most valuable possessions in my safe. This structure of zone-based security that each of us has in our house is the foundation to physical security here at the refinery. This guard booth is the front door. When we pass through the front door, we step into the entrance and general living area. In the refinery, that zone may include general office space, the cafeteria, and maybe some training rooms. The production area, where the refining happens, requires a whole nother level of security, similar to the lock on your bedroom at home or your office. And then another security zone in the refinery limits access to the top secret research and development area, or maybe an area that has explosion risk. This is similar to the valuables in your, sa in your safe at home or a locked medicine cabinet, for instance. Hopefully comparing these security zones in your house to the zones in a refinery help to make the concept a bit clearer. Because soon we'll enter the virtual cyber world and apply the same concepts there. As we assess the risk of each area in the refinery, we start to recognize who needs to enter each area and who really doesn't. This assessment and decision making begins to establish a security policy that describes each security zone and who can enter. To enforce this policy, we identify all the doors that allow people to move between zones. And then we use secu the security policy we just made to identify who has authority to pass through each door and who doesn't. This is exactly the same as deciding who has access to the combination lock of my safe and who doesn't. Now hang on, we're about to enter the virtual world of cyber. <laughs> the zone-based security idea we just went through for physical spaces also applies in the cyber or digital world. Outside the front door, we have the internet. Anyone from anywhere in the world can try to enter your cyber front door. And in the cyber case, they also try to get into your windows, down the chimney, and pretty much anywhere that might provide an opening. It's relatively simple for us to imagine a secure perimeter around virtual assets, kind of like the walls of a space that we encountered before. It used to be that sealing up this virtual perimeter, or cyber perimeter, was the focus of security professionals. But this idea of a cyber perimeter is impossible to define today. People are working from anywhere that they need, and they need access to all of their systems from wherever they are. They don't work inside a perimeter, so we need to think of zone concepts as virtual and not physical. Let me explain what that means. 
It means that industry experts join video calls to field workers from their living room or from a coffee shop. It means that site engineers are checking their work email on a personal phone. It means having a business partner log into your top secret system to do maintenance. Your perimeter is now virtually extended to all these places like living rooms, coffee shops, and personal phones. Cybersecurity zones are not associated with physical buildings and rooms anymore. They are defined more specifically by individual assets and individual software instances running on those assets. Let me give you an example in the context of this refinery. Let's consider the physical admin cafeteria and training zone from earlier. The cyber equivalent would be maybe IT managed phones and laptops, email servers, and corporate HR systems. These are the systems that almost everyone in the company uses. A different security zone may be the finance systems and any browsers that are logged into those systems. Yet another zone could be a control system zone that is made up of control units, sensors, and actuators in the refining process. Each zone has a different grouping of software and assets that have similar risk profiles and similar access policies. Someone who has access to the control system zone may not have access to the finance system zone, and vice versa. The virtual part is what sometimes trips us up. You may have all three of these zones in the same physical room, but virtually separated. You may have a finance person and their laptop in the finance zone visiting an operation center, which is clearly in the control system zone. But that room also contains IT managed phones, which are in the IT managed phone zone. All three virtual zones exist in the same physical space, but need to be kept separate in the cyber world. Information entering a phone can only flow freely between other phones and phone related systems. A phone can't directly communicate to a control system or a finance server, even though those zones all exist in the same physical room. Now that we've clearly identified how these zones are virtually separated, we also recognize that in some cases, communication actually does need to happen between zones. Let's think of an example. In the control system zone, we collect information about the control process that can really only happen in the control system zone because that's where it's going on. But that information might be necessary for some finance people to make some decisions. So this information may need to automatically flow through the, from the control system zone over to the finance server in the finance zone. This way it can be referenced by finance systems when they run their reports. All communication between security zones like this must pass through a communication control point, similar to the locked door in the physical system. That control point, like a, like a firewall for instance, manages communication or information movement between these zones. Information can only move between zones through specific conduits or openings, and information flows must be precisely controlled to comply with the behavior defined in the cybersecurity policy. This policy is similar to the security policy that we talked about earlier in the physical security system. The cybersecurity policy describes the asset groups and systems with similar risk profiles and then groups them into zones. Then it describes what assets, people, and systems are allowed to communicate with that zone. The communication control points, like locked doors in the physical systems, are then used to enforce that policy and make sure that security policy is adhered to. This idea of zones and communication control points is foundational to all cybersecurity. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're defining and implementing this model. This is why security companies like Cisco Systems, the company that I work for, are needed to help assess risk, design zones, and build control points. There are a number of standards out there published by the IEC, the ISA, uh, NIST, and others that provide standard guidance in this process. These standards go far beyond the preventative system I just described, and also describe how to detect when things go wrong, and how to respond and restore after you detect problems. Those topics will have to wait for future videos, so keep an eye on this channel. In the meantime, 
Check out more videos about industrial topics in energy and mining on this channel. Take care.